It's time for questions to the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, and we'd start with listed questions. And I would like to welcome the Minister to our first question time. I call Daniel McCrossan. Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, and I too would like to congratulate the Minister on her elevation to her new role. Uh, question one, Minister. I'm aware of the difficulties facing pig farmers right across Northern Ireland, including West Tyrone, as a result of depressed pork prices. Whilst the factors contributing to depressed prices are outside DERA's control, my department will continue to work to build the resilience, sufficiency and competitiveness of the sector and to help farmers cope with future market volatility. To that end, my department is working to facilitate access for our pig sector to key third country markets uh, for pork exports, including China and Australia. I'm aware that many farm businesses are experiencing cash flow issues during this period of low returns. I've written to the local banks and financial institutions to arrange a number of meetings over the coming weeks to discuss what further measures the banks, together with my department, can take to assist the industry during this difficult trading period. I also intend to meet the two main peak, uh, pork processing companies in the near future. My department is continuing to support the pig sector through the provision of education, training and research in order to improve efficiency and sustainability. We will continue to make the most of measures through the new Rural Development Programme to help ensure that farmers are better equipped to meet the challenges ahead. Call Daniel McCrossan for a supplementary. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her answer so far? Uh, can I also ask the Minister to outline what her department has been doing to secure access to new trade markets and, in particular, uh, update us on the discussions with Australia and China? Uh, pork producers are really keen that the Chinese market uh, is opened up. And I thank, thank the member for his question. Indeed, um, he's absolutely right that um, pork producers and um, processors are, are looking for um, access to those markets and securing markets to the likes of Australia and China remain a top priority for my department. It's hoped that securing access to new trade markets such as those in China and Australia would mean greater returns for the pig sector and so help mitigate the effects on producers of future price fluctuations. Therefore, securing approval to export may help to mitigate the impact of other market forces. My department awaits a response from China on the remedial actions our pork processors have taken following the inspection in April 2015. Um, I spoke with the Chinese Consul General to Northern Ireland, Madam Wang, um, quite recently, and she's been incredibly helpful. Um, and, and I'm waiting for a response um, via um, her offices. My department also hosted Australian inspectors in April 2016 and we await their written report later this year. As you'd expect, my officials are also working closely with the industry to make them aware of the opportunities available to those markets already open for export. Paul Thomas Buchanan. I commend the Minister in her new role and wish her well in the future, but can the Minister inform the House as to what Europe is doing, if anything, to help our hard-pressed pork sector here in Northern Ireland? And I thank the member for his question, and um, I, I suppose I leave it up to him as to whether or not he believes it to be enough or not. Um, but the Commission's main tool for stabilising the pig, pig meat sector in times of crisis is the provision of private storage aid, which provides aid to processors to assist in the costs of storing meat, pig meat that is surplus to demand. In response to the difficult market situation, the Commission offered um, a private storage aid scheme for pig meat in January this year, with local processors receiving approval to place 195 tonnes into storage under the scheme. Overall, the EU scheme um, removed over 90,000 tonnes of pork products from the market at a cost of nearly 28 million euro. Whilst pig prices here are still around 12 per cent below 2015 prices at 106 pence per kilo, they have risen by 5 pence per kilo over the last couple of months. An improvement in prices has been seen across Europe, and I hope that that does continue. The Commission has stated that it continues to monitor market conditions in the sector and has indicated that it will consider the possible introduction of a new private storage aid scheme for pig meat at an appropriate time. In March 2016, the European Commission set up 
a new export group called the Meat Marketing Observatory as part of the package of support measures for the sector. The group is scheduled to meet for the first time on the 15th of July. The European Commission has also set up an agricultural markets task force which is looking at the functioning of agricultural markets and the farmers position in the food supply chain and I'm pleased that we do have a local representative um, Dr David Dobbin on the task force. Northern Ireland also receives European funding for the Rural Development Programme 2014-2020 and there will be opportunities for the pig industry to avail of support through the new business, um, farm business improvement scheme which includes a package of measures to support sustainable growth in the farming sector. The FBIS, business development groups and farm family key skills measures are already launched and subject to necessary approvals. FBIS capital scheme will be rolled out next. Um, sir, um, I thank the, the Minister for an answer. Um, could the, the, minister, the Minister have any plans to expand and develop on our uh, links that has been made in China as regards the uh, pork industry? I thank the, um, the member for his, his question and obviously we're, we're, still, we're still waiting for a response coming back um, from China in relation to remedial actions for the, for the pork sector. Obviously any opportunities that there are and any opportunities that, 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 they, that may um, open up in future will obviously be explored and it will be something that I will be very keen to work alongside um, DEFRA and others in relation to that. Call Jim Wells. Uh, question number two, Madam Speaker. As the member will be aware, it takes a considerable length of time to grow a forest. Forests now cover 8% of Northern Ireland from almost nothing at the beginning of the last century, and the area for forest is slowly increasing. The department has two schemes. The first is delivered by the Forest Service which plans to reopen the forest expansion scheme in July 2016 and aims to plant woodlands of five hectares or more. The first tranche of the scheme received applications for over 330 hectares of new woodland. We issued offers for over 250 hectares and have received claims for 184 hectares, including 108 hectares of deciduous broadleaf woodland. The second scheme is managed by the department to support planting of smaller native broadleaf woodlands and will open as part of the environmental farming scheme. While at the Armagh uh, show in the very beautiful Gosford Forest Park, I had the opportunity to speak to a very enthusiastic forestry consultant who specialises in indigenous trees and to hear of the schemes that she has been delivering alongside local farmers. Northern Ireland's forests and woodlands are an important resource and I plan to visit a number of forests and sawmill businesses over the summer to understand how both deciduous and conifer forests contribute to economic development, as well as improving our environment and providing places to visit. Stephen, have you? Oh. Oh. Uh, excuse me, sorry, my mistake. I called Jim Wells for a supplementary. I will then call Stephen Agnew. <laughs> And I go and rebuild my life. Um, I w welcome uh, the, the Minister's answer. Um, does she feel that the range of policies uh, that are present in position within DART are sufficient to meet uh, the, the need for increased deciduous woodland planting in Northern Ireland? I thank the, the member for his question. Um, the RDP budget is sufficient to pay for 1,800 hectares of new planting. And I hope that landowners will respond positively to the new scheme that allows for up to 100% of eligible costs. If demand increases above expectations, then I certainly will review the funding which is being made available for that. I am aware that rates of grant and funding available are not, not the only factors that landowners take into account in forestry schemes. However, this is a good opportunity for those thinking about diversifying away from farming um, to consider. I call Alan Chambers. Uh, Deputy Principal, uh, Speaker, uh, would the Minister uh, support a target for increasing woodland cover to be included in the programme for government, as was the case previously, uh, but noticeably absent from the last? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank, thank the member for his question. And, um, the 2006 forestry, forest strategy identified a long-term aim 
to increase woodland cover um, to 12% of land area by 2050. And that was providing uh, people in Northern Ireland with access to the same level of um, forestry benefits as elsewhere in the United Kingdom. Uh, the forestry chapter in the Rural Development Programme, as I've outlined, um, create, aims to create a further 1,800 hectares of woodland by 2020. And this will make a small, but it will make a positive contribution um, towards our aim of 12% woodland area. Um, obviously, it's something which we'll look at um, as we move forward and, and as the programme and as the programme for government is consulted on. Thank you. Called Stephen Agnew. Well, Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister for an update on the proposed transfer of Kern Wood to Forestry Service, and is she today in a position to guarantee that public access will be retained? Okay, and, and, and I thank the, 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 the member for his question. And, and as he's aware, Forest Service currently manages um, the trees at Ballysala Forest on um, land, most of which is owned by Northern Ireland Water, and access to water and land around the res reservoir remains currently a matter for Northern Ireland for Northern Ireland Water. In the last mandate, the member and I spoke on, on several occasions in relation to the sale of this site when I was a regional development minister, um, and indeed I know that he's keen to retain access to the public um, to this site, and this was key to to those discussions. Uh, my colleague Gordon Dunn uh, was particularly helpful following um, discussions he had had with Forest Service and opening up further um, discussions with them. At this stage, Forest um, Service is considering a positive business case for the transfer of land to my department's ownership, but there are still some key issues to be resolved. Um, Forest Service is clearly the best organisation to manage the trees. But it does need Arts and North Down Borough Council or a partner of equivalent standing to take responsibility for managing public access, um, which was uh, of primary concern at the time of the proposed sale and indeed um, was reinforced by councillors and MLAs at that, at that time. Um, I'm aware that um, Forestry Service has written to the council uh, and the council are, are looking at that at the moment. I call Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. I uh, congratulate the Minister on her appointment as well and thank her for the update in relation to Cairnwood Forest. I uh, could ask the Minister if she'd be willing to meet with me in relation to the developments around that particular issue. Uh, thank the member for his question. And I, I've met with the member before and I'm willing to meet with any member on any issue in relation to anything within my department, so of course that's not a problem. I called Stephen Farry for a question. Three. Minister. Executive agreement to proceed with the relocation to Ballykelly is already in place and the contract for construction has been awarded to JH Turkington and Sons. As I progress with the plans, however, I am acutely aware of the importance of business continuity and the need to have plans in place that take account of retaining crucial skills and corporate knowledge. This is particularly so given the potential scale of staff turnover both in and out of my department over the coming years. I'm currently considering a detailed staffing plan that sets out what posts will relocate to Ballykelly and when they will relocate. To ensure any risk to business continuity um, is effectively managed, my intention is to phase the transition off posts so that the skills and corporate knowledge needed can be preserved. This approach will mainly see corporate service support posts move first by December 2017. The skills required for these posts are of a generalist nature and are available throughout the Northern Ireland Civil Service. There's certainly a balance um, which needs to be found between relocating posts from Belfast to Ballykelly alongside retaining key skills and corporate knowledge and then taking the move to Ballykelly forward I want to reflect further on the plans at this stage and um, to see what best suits the long-term needs of my department whilst ensuring the, that the new site at Ballykelly is a success and provides opportunities for people who live in the northwest of Northern Ireland. Farry for supplementary. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, and I also welcome the Minister to her new post. The Minister will be aware that her Permanent Secretary has said to the relevant committee that this move could take up to 2029, yes you heard me right, 2029, uh, for this to be um, completed. And bearing in mind this actually is going to cost uh, the public sector money as well. Um, what 
assessment is the Minister making herself of the risk to business continuity and the service that her department provides the whole range of, of stakeholders? And is she prepared to give this House a guarantee that there won't be any impact uh, from this costly move? Minister. Um, I thank the, the member for his question and note the concerns which he has in relation to that. And I have addressed that there are risks associated with that, and particularly around the loss of skills and corporate knowledge. And I am very keen to ensure that that um, is not to the detriment of my department. Um, I am considering various um, options around um, the transition. Um, and I, I also would like to note that there, there may be opportunities to broaden the remit of Ballykelly, but those are discussions which I maybe need to, to have a conversation with, with executive colleagues. Um, if there is any plan to broaden this out to the wider civil service in order to give further opportunities um, for those living in the North West um, to work within the Northern Ireland Civil Service. I call Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the Minister to, to your new post. Minister, some of your, your party members have been mischievous in regards to our party's stance on Bally Kelly, and it has been surely purely on the financial side rather than disingenuous uh, to our reflection in the North West. Can the Minister explain why her department did not look at the DVA offices in Coleraine as a viable alternative? Um, I thank the, the member for his question. And at this stage, I am not actually aware that what, whether that was discounted or not or at what stage, but certainly happy to look at that. Um, but as we stand at the moment, um, where we are is that we are moving forward with the, um, the construction of that site and what we are looking to do is to make best use of that site. George Robinson. Thank you, Mr. Er, Deputy Speaker. And coming from the constituency of East London, I, <clears throat> I obviously welcome the development at Ballykelly. Can the Minister remind the House of the benefits of the scheme? The benefits of the scheme. Minister. Okay, thank the, the member for his question. Of course, the, the relocation of a civil service departmental headquarters was one of the recommendations in the independent review of policy on location of public sector jobs. Uh, the proposed relocation will stimulate the local economy through increased local spending, provision of high quality and high value public sector jobs, and potentially jobs associated with the construction of and the ongoing servicing of a new building. The relocation will also help to share wealth across the economy and contribute to better balanced economic growth by commencing to address disparities in the distribution of public sector jobs in Northern Ireland. Paul Sean Lynch, Aaron Sean my Lynch. Prayer, last can call you. The Minister talked about the scale of the transition. Has she any uh, confirmed timetable? Good. Thank the, um, the member for his question. And at this stage, what we are looking for is um, to have the, the, the obviously the appointment of the building design construction um, consultant was appointed in January 2016. Planning approval was February 2016, and we appointed the contractor in March 2016. Construction will start in September this year, and the handover of the building will be in 2017. Um, and it is hoped that. Um, the, the first people to, to use that building will then be in January 18. Sir Jerry Mullen, I call Jerry Mullen. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for answers thus far. But can I ask the Minister, um, could she provide details on the number of people within her department who have taken up voluntary exit rather than relocate to Balakelly, and to detail what amount of money this may cost? At this, at this point in time, I, I can give the, I can give the member a very general view, overview of that. Um, but the relocation will see approximately 600 posts move, um, which represent 20% of the total um, departmental staffing of 3,000. Um, HR strategy is in place, which will provide the overall direction for the people element of relocation and details um, the detailed work completed so far. Um, as far as possible, no one will be forced to move to Ballykelly. Um, so if, they, if it's being inferred that perhaps people took voluntary exit because they didn't wish to move, um, that has been made quite clear throughout this process that no one would be made and no one would be forced to move. Uh, and certainly I've had conversations with a number of, of people in and around that. Um, now while the majority of the current headquarters staff don't wish to relocate, expressions of interest have. Um, being gained via surveys right across the Northern Ireland Civil Service, and that shows that there is a significant level of interest in taking up posts in Ballykelly. Paul Edwin Poots. Question number four. 
As you're aware, bovine TB is a complex disease and is the most costly animal health problem in Northern Ireland. Total programme costs amount to some £27 million to taxpayers and £10 million compliance costs to farmers. The programme receives around £4 million funding from the EU each year. Cattle herds are tested at least annually and animals that respond positively to the skin test are removed to slaughter with compensation paid at full market value. In 2015, Dard slaughtered 12,130 animals as a result of TB. This includes reactors, negative in contacts and interferon gamma, positive only cattle. I should stress that at any time, even at current disease levels, around 93% of herds are free from restrictions associated with TB and open for trading purposes. I'm aware that food production is impacted when a herd has a TB breakdown. Associated losses include the consequential loss of milk, beef production, etc., when animals are slaughtered prematurely as reactors before the optimum time. In addition, there can be temporary production losses, for example, drop in milk yield or weight gain as a result of increased testing in a breakdown herd. While this does impact on individual farmers, I would stress that the overall programme protects our ability to trade. The value of milk production is some £480 million annually and the value of the beef sector is around £394 million annually. It's our aim to eradicate eradicate DTB from Northern Ireland, but this will be a long-term strategy and industry support will be essential. Edwin Poots for a supplementary. Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, um, thank the Minister for her response and wish her well in her role. Um, I believe one of the biggest challenges will be TB uh, moving forward and over the course of the last 30 years there hasn't been uh, a significant improvement in it. Uh, Minister, you have the TB uh, partnership working group and I would assume that that partnership working group will look at the full extent of TB and therefore our efforts will not just be restricted um, to the bovine population but also to the wildlife population in seeking to identify a means of better dealing with TB and driving those figures down uh, towards what they are in the Republic of Ireland and indeed Scotland. Thank the, the member for his, his, his questions. Um, as he has said, an industry-led strategic partnership group was established in 2014 to develop a comprehensive and practical long-term TB eradication strategy and implementation action plan to progressively reduce TB levels in cattle here and ultimately eradicate the disease from the cattle population in Northern Ireland. The group comprises the chair, four independent members and two DARD ex officio members and the aim is to reduce TB disease levels and costs by the greatest degree in the shortest time using the least resource. The group is currently reviewing evidence in preparation for production of their TB eradication strategy and subsequent um, implementation action plan. And although the group were tasked to provide with their TB strategy and plan, um, as they were, this was to be with us by December 2015. The work has proved more complex than originally envisaged. In addition, the group wished to obtain some independent socioeconomic analysis of their emerging recommendations before finalising the strategy. I am disappointed that the work will not be concluded more quickly. It's important um, it is important that the group has considered all the issues to ensure a robust and well-considered um, strategy is produced. Um, I can give a commitment to the members that this issue will be um, prioritised by myself to try and reduce disease levels both in cattle and in the wildlife population. From Sir Linda Dillon, Cahir Lachdam Koshta, I call Linda Dillon Chair of the Committee. Can the Minister tell us what the incidents for bovine TB have been in this year and how that compares to previous years, whether there has been an increase or a decrease? Uh, I don't actually have the exact figures, but um, in 2015, um, 12,130 animals were um, slaughtered as a result of TB. Um, I can get the exact figures for the member and, and provide those for her. Here, Sir Patsy McLone. I call Patsy McLone. 
Thanks very much, Ms. Ms. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for her answer. Um, according to the media reports yesterday, there are limited amounts of available vaccine uh, for the, the attempts to eradicate or indeed limit the TB. Um, has, has the Minister uh, uh, made any further inquiries around the available amounts of vaccine? And indeed, has the Department ruled out the possibilities of cull as an option to deal with cullabadgers, that is, to deal with the, the issue of the prevalence of TB? Okay, and I thank, thank the member for his question. I'm aware that there is a global shortage of both human and badger BCG vaccination. This has affected supplies in 2016. Um, and you'll obviously be aware that we, we use this through the, in the TVR um, programme in the Banbridge area. Um, I can, can confirm that in 2015, um, DERA had sufficient um, Badger BCG vaccine for year two of the TVR projects. Um, and years one and two of the research, we used the, the Danish strain of BCG and vaccine to vaccinate caught badgers. Um, the current supply of this is unable to fulfil any order for the vaccine in 2016, um, and has been an indication that um, that, there, that there are stock that there, there are low in stocks. Um, both the Welsh government and DEFRA have suspended their vaccination programmes. Um, however, what we have been able to do is to source a limited supply of um, expired Badger BCG Danish vaccine. Um, from the Welsh Government for use in our TVR project for 2016. And this will provide us with continuity for the research um, as it progresses into the third year. Uh, my, my officials are in the process of organising a stakeholder event um, with the farmers in the TVR area to update them on the development. Um, with regards to a cull, um, that certainly isn't something which I've had a conversation with my officials in relation to. I call Rosemary Barton. Thank you very much. Thank you. Minister, <clears throat> I would like you, we have had a disastrous approach in tackling TB from your previous ministers. Can you today state exactly how you intend to improve upon this? We have talked about vaccine. Any other? Anything else? Can I ask the minister to be brief in her response because we are nearing time for topical. I thank the, the member for her question. As, as I have stated, the TB Strategic Partnership Group will be um, coming back to me um, in, the, in the autumn with recommendations. So we we'll hope to look at, at those recommendations and, uh, and move forward with them. Um, as you'll also be aware, the TVR programme is, is ongoing. At the end of this, I do want to have um, healthy cattle, healthy badgers, and a healthy ecosystem, and that would be the desire that I would have um, through, in, my, in addressing this problem. I call David Ford. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I also welcome the Minister to her question time and declaring my interest as a part owner of a small herd of cattle and land on which a badger set stands, can I ask what lessons she and her officials have learnt from the failure of the cull in England, where it appears, according to the words of Owen Patterson, that the badgers moved the goalposts? I thank the, I thank Very the brief member, response. Thank the member for his, his question. Uh, and as, he, as he heard my response to the previous member, I haven't had a discussion with um, officials in relation to your call. Um, at the moment, the, the focus has been very much on the, um, the recommendations which are likely to come forward from, from the group and also with regards to the TVR project. And that ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Mark Durkin. I'd also like to wish the Minister well in her new role. I know she'll have some very difficult issues to deal with. One such issue that is close to my own heart and close to my own home is the illegal super dump at uh, Maboy Road in Campsie. I wonder if the Minister could provide an update to the House on how that is being dealt with now. I uh, thank, thank the member for his question, and indeed he will, has been very close to this with regards to where he lives and also within his previous role. Um, and really of most concern is the protection of, of the River Falcon, which forms the western boundary of the site and is designated as an area of special scientific in interest and a special area of conservation. Um, the key priority for the department is to protect both the water quality and public water supply in the river and to ensure that any site cleanup provides value for money. 
The site and size and complexity of the Moboy waste site means that its remediation will not be a quick fix, as, as he, will, he will know. Um, three feasible um, remediation options have been shortlisted, namely excavation and disposal, containment and on-site treatment, with preliminary costs ranging from £20 million to £140 million. Further work is ongoing to detail the options further, and I expect a full report of the remediation options for my consideration in December 2016. However, in the meantime, I have tasked my officials to ensure short-term measures are in place to protect both the environment and human health. NIEA has been successful in securing £400,000 to launch phase one of a small business research initiative competition in partnership with Innovate UK to stimulate the development of innovative remediation treatments for waste illegally deposited at Moboy Road and mitigation of its impacts on the surrounding environment. The project has received £100,000 from the Northern Ireland Executive's Pilot SBRI Challenge Fund. The outcomes of the competition will further inform the remediation strategy for the Moboy site. Mark Durkin for supplementary. I would and, and to thank the Minister for that update. I would also like to actually commend the work of those NIA officials who have left literally, been left literally to clean up the, the, a mess made by criminals, but actually made easy by the actions or inactions of government departments in the past. I uh, wonder, could the Minister give me an assurance that she will seek to find the funding necessary for a public inquiry uh, into the situation at Maboy, either from within her own uh, departmental budget or with the help of her executive colleagues. And, and again, I thank, thank the member for, for his question. Um, and he'll, he'll obviously be aware of, of the Mills report and the, the number of recommendations that were made in relation to that. Um, and work has obviously been going, ongoing in order to address the recommendations of that report. Um, as you will also know, the activity is um, subject to ongoing um, criminal proceedings. Um, now, I know that the previous executive did consider um, suggestions for a public inquiry, but due to those ongoing actions um, highlighted that the undefined resource implications did not um, conclude agreement on a public inquiry before the end of the last mandate. So as far as I can understand, those reasons still stand, um, and certainly we'll need to see the outworkings of the, um, of the criminal proceedings before we would make any decision. I call Thomas Buchanan. Can the Minister inform the House if she has a view on the EU referendum debate, debate and how the rural community should vote this Thursday? Thank the, the, the member for his, his question, and unlike some other parties, the Democratic Unionist Party has a very clear line yeah. with regards to this week's referendum. We are Eurosceptic and believe that Northern Ireland is better off out of Europe. Over the last four weekends, over the last four weekends I've been to rural shows throughout Northern Ireland. I've been to shows in Ballymena, Ballymoney, Armagh, and most recently yeah. Sainfield. And it's very clear from the majority of our farmers, and particularly our fishermen, that they are tired with the red tape and bureaucracy which is coming from Europe. They're tired of having to jump through hurdles to get a diminishing amount of funding. Europe is doing little to help support many of the hard-pressed sectors survive the current downturn. I'm confident that Northern Ireland farming will survive outside Europe. Both the Remain and Leave camps have accepted that there, will be a, that there will be support available to UK farmers outside of Europe. I'm confident that there will be the free movement of goods between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, and that other countries from outside the EU will look to take the high quality produce coming from our farms, our seas, and our processors. I do accept that there are many unanswered questions if we leave the EU, but there are as many, if not more, unanswered questions if we remain. Nobody knows how much funding will come into Northern Ireland after 2019, or what rules will be connected to that funding. There's only one guarantee that I can give this House um, this afternoon, and I will guarantee that as the new Minister, regardless of whether we are in or out of Europe, that I will defend the interests of Northern Ireland, whether this is in Brussels or in London, and I will work to ensure that Northern Ireland farmers and fishermen can survive and grow after this week's referendum.
Thomas Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank you, and thank the Minister for her response. But can the Minister give the House a reassurance that farmers will still receive their single farm payment this year, irrespective of what way the vote goes on Thursday? Uh, thank the, the, um, the member for his question. And, and I have picked up some concerns that if the UK votes to leave, that farmers may not receive their single farm payments this autumn. Uh, this, I have no doubt, is part of the confusion and some of the misinformation that's been associated with the referendum campaign. If the UK vote to leave Europe this week, we will enter a period of negotiations between the EU and the UK that will take at least two years. This will decide how the UK leaves and over what period. As I've already said, I'm confident that farmers will continue to receive support regardless of the outcome of the effort referendum debate. I'm Sir Catherine Seeley. I call Catherine Seeley. Gurumila Mayogut, Pray of Las Concordia, and can I take this opportunity to wish the Minister all the best in her new role? Can I ask the Minister for a full updated report on the Department's actions following the oil spill on the East Antrim coast Saturday, June 11th, which emanated from a local business in Lorne? Absolutely. Um, the the NIEA was notified by the Larne um, Assist Harbour Master of a heavy sheen of oil in the water at the Port of Larne at 8.55 on Saturday the 11th of June. Um, he also stated that a very pungent smell had been noted very late on in the Friday night and that the fire brigade had been called but nothing was seen on the water. On receipt of the report, NIEA staff were tasked to the area to investigate. Caterpillar NI Limited contacted the water pollution hotline at 11.43 on Saturday the 11th of June to report that storage tanks within their factory located on the Old Glen Arm Road had overflowed and that red diesel had made its way into the site's surface water drainage system. Surface water drainage from the site is discharged into the Irish Sea through a sea outfall. Caterpillar was unable to confirm at this time the quantity of fuel that had been lost or when the discharge actually happened. Subsequently, Caterpillar and I re released a press statement saying that they had lost 40,000 litres of red diesel on Saturday um, the 11th and that they had regretted the mistake and were working to address the consequences. The company also stated that they had employed environmental contractors. My department lifted statutory samples at that weekend and over the next few days a representative of the company will be interviewed under caution with a view to prosecution. Seely for a supplementary. And I thank the Minister for her response. Can I also ask the Minister what measures she intends uh, to take to prevent incidents of, of this sort um, reoccurring in the future? thank the member for a question and, and obviously this is something which um, my department are, are very keen to ensure doesn't happen um, and will work alongside companies and indeed the agricultural sector um, to educate and inform them um, but at the same time I think we need to lead, show an example and that those who, who do um, pollute our waterways are, are prosecuted. I call Paula Bradshaw. Thank you, um, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank you um, for taking the question. Can I ask the Minister on what basis she can give the commitment, as referenced in the newsletter today, that in the event of Brexit, that farm subsidies will be paid by the UK Treasury? Thank the, the, um, the member for her question. And of course, we have actually no guarantees that we are going to be getting um, the, the same amount of um, subsidy from the EU post-2019. Um, the direction of travel, as you will be aware, is to have a flat payment across Europe, um, which was disadvantaging all the Northern Ireland, or, no, disadvantaging Northern Ireland farmers in comparison to those in, in Eastern Europe. Um, of course, where we are, um, there are no guarantees um, with being in Europe or being outside of Europe. But I think that we, we can be sure that, given remarks made by the Prime Minister, that um, our UK farmers will be looked after. Paula Bradshaw for supplementary. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Um, does the Minister recognise that the UK Government does not place the same priority on rural communities and farms in terms of support as we would here in Northern Ireland. And so I would ask you how you could be confident that we would get the same level of support from the UK government, which has different priorities. I think 
over the last number of years there's been an over-reliance um, on, on European monies coming through. Um, I think that we will be, all have to reprioritise and I certainly don't think we can ignore the fact that one in four of our businesses um, are employed in agricultural and forestry and fishing. Um, and certainly it's for all of us to make sure that we get the best, make the best case for our farmers um, when we're negotiating um, with the Treasury. Sir Sinead Bradley. I call Sinead Bradley. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister, please, for her assessment of the Challenge Fund? Certainly. Um, the Challenge Fund has actually been something which has been uh, a very positive um, initiative, which was brought forward um, as a result of the carrier bag levy revenue, and it was caught over £4.6 million pounds worth. Um, and this was um, from 2011. Um, almost 600 environmental projects have been completed across the breadth of Northern Ireland, and it's enabled um, schools and communities and all at grassroots level to become engaged um, in order to enhance um, a shared environment through the delivery of local environmental uh, projects. Um, these have included a diverse range of projects, including helping wildlife, creating green space, um, providing learning experiences, and, and cleaning up the local environments. So it's actually been a very positive fund. Sinead Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you. Uh, given the Minister's positive response, I would like to ask, is it your intention to commit to funding this fund for years ahead? I uh, thank the, the member for her question. Um, and as she will be aware that the, the former Department of the Environment did not launch um, a 2016-17 fund prior to the formation of my department. However, I have noted the success of it. Um, I would like to, and I intend to, review the estimated 2016-17 um, carrier bag levy income against existing commitments. Um, and it's certainly something which I've been looking positively on, although at this stage I can't guarantee. I call William Irwin. Thank you, Mr. Madam and Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I uh, add my congratulations to the Minister and wish her well in her new role? There was recently uh, was a consultation carried out by the former department uh, looking into top slicing of the basic payment scheme to fund either couple payments or areas of natural constraint. Is this your intention, Minister? Thank the member for his question. I've listened carefully to the views of farming stakeholders. Um, there was little support from farming stakeholders to use funding from Pillar 1 to operate a future ANC scheme, either by top slicing or by transferring monies to Pillar 2. Nor do I believe that there are any convincing arguments to introduce coupled support schemes in Northern Ireland during the current cap period. Therefore, I do not intend to top slice the basic payment scheme to fund either coupled payments or an areas of natural constraint scheme under Pillar 1 of the cap. Furthermore, I do not intend to introduce a Pillar 1 to Pillar 2 transfer to fund an areas of natural constraint scheme in Pillar 2 under the Rural Development Programme. In relation to support to the ANCs, these options are not new monies, but would operate by redistributing Pillar 1 monies from the DA and Lowland to the SDA, reinforcing the existing redistribution in this direction, arising from the move to a flat rate payment scheme. Jim Irwin for a quick supplementary. Thank you, Anthony, and I thank the Minister for her response. It will be welcome news to many farmers that there will be no further additional cuts to their basic payments in order to fund other schemes. Has the Minister ruled out any future support payments to farmers in severely, severely damaged and disadvantaged areas? I do recognise that support payments, including Pillar 1 support, are important sources of income on farms within this severely disadvantaged area. I am still considering options, but given the pressures on both my departments and the executive's budget, providing any additional support will be challenging. I cannot, cannot ignore long-term value for money, nor indeed the redistribution of Pillar 1 monies, which is occurring as a result of the transition towards flat rate support in Pillar 1. Well, Philip Logan for a question. Thank you, uh, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister for an update on the uh, leader programme and how that will benefit uh, rural businesses? Thank you. 
Thank the member for his question. Leader through the Rural um, Business Investment Scheme delivered by the local action groups can support rural micro and small businesses with capital grants to start up new businesses or expand existing ones. The key driver is to create new jobs and help expand the rural economy. Applicants must attend a funding workshop in their area where the application process will be explained to them and they can then submit an expression of interest to their lag. If deemed, el deemed eligible, they will be invited to submit an application for grant at the appropriate time. I'm sorry, there won't be time for supplementary. We're moving to questions for the Minister for Finance. I was Tafal Chiro with the ARA and Kate Thronagest. I went.